Okay. Is that good? Is this thing on? Like that? Okay. What do you think about trust? Trust. Trust is a funny thing. So often, Christians use trust or faith as a crutch. Let me let you in on a little secret. I've spent thousands of years researching the human mind. You know what I found? It's weak. Easily manipulated. I think trust is for lazy people. If you want something, you have to make it happen. You can't just sit there with your hands clasped, praising and praying to some cosmic bully to fill your needs. No, it's a doggy dog world out there. If you want something, you have to take it. You need to trust in your own abilities to provide for your needs. Hey, good morning. Of all the things that I've followed, I've never followed Satan on video. It's a little bit disturbing. What do you do next? It's kind of where I'm at. Happened last night, happened again this morning. I don't know what to say. We're really glad you're here today. My name's Todd Arnett, one of the pastors here at HDC. It's a privilege to get to be with you. And uh, we kick off a brand new series today called Trust Fund. In order to track with us a little bit better, you might need some notes. If you didn't get those on the way in today, we have some very well-equipped uh, individuals who'd love to get you a copy. So if you just raise your hand, they will charge you $3, and then they will give you, just pass your money down like you're at a ball game, down to the end, and they'll hook you up. They paid me to say that. They're running low on funds. So... We are really glad you're here. Uh, just finished up a great series in the first six chapters of 1 Corinthians. We will address the book later on in this calendar year. We're going to take a break, and we hit into something called Trust Fund. Here at HDC, we talk every weekend about the fact that you are to be a world changer. God has designed you, he's built you, he's equipped you to change your world, your oikos, your 8 to 15, that he has supernaturally, strategically placed you in for the purpose of influencing those folks to be like Christ, to know him by the way they see you, by the way they hear you, etc. And, and a lot of being a world changer really develops or finds itself rooted in trust. So that word trust is really key to what we do, what we talk about all the time. Trust has a few different ways of understanding the word, a noun form of the word trust. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. It's something or something held by one party for the benefit of another. A trust, something held by one party for the benefit of another. That's one way to think of the word, and we will address that the next couple of weeks in our series. Today we're going to look more at the verb form of the word trust, having confidence or faith in someone else. Having confidence or faith in someone else. That's what it means to trust. And, and that's, that's pretty um, a basic understanding that you are like, wow, I am so glad I came to church today. <laughs> I had no idea what trust was till Todd said that. Um, you knew that already. And then the reality is this, that if we are called to be trustworthy trustees of what God has given us in so many things, our resources, our, our relationships, our, our uh, gifts, if we're called to be trustworthy trustees, that is actually rooted, it begins with, it is built upon our initial trust in God. And the more that we keep experiencing his reliability, his faithfulness to us, we keep understanding that we can live productive, that we can live the kinds of lives that are pleasing to him because we know that we're not on our own. And we know that we're not just trying harder to be gooder. We know that we're not just trying to change our world by ourselves. God never commissioned us to do that. He asks us to trust him as we go about the business he's called us to, living a life of great purpose. So in your notes, the reality is this, God's trustworthiness develops ours. They are in tandem, they are connected. God's trustworthiness develops ours. And as we continue to recognize him, experience his reliability, his trustworthiness, our trustworthiness towards him grows. Or at least it's supposed to. 
At least it's supposed to. There's not a person in this room today who would say that I completely trust God for everything in my life. No one in this room who would raise their hand and say, Todd, in every area of my being, everything that is valuable to me, everything that is important to me, I have it fully brought to the cross and said, Jesus, it's yours. And I know that because I just know me. And I know you. And I know that over the course of our lives, think back to a year ago where you were the first weekend of March, 2000 and and what was that? Yeah, 10. And uh, think where you are now a year later. Think about some of the things that you have actually entrusted to God that you hadn't a year ago. And there may be a few things on that list. Go back even farther, five years ago, 10 years ago. There are things that you have brought to God, brought to that altar and said, God, I leave it there, I walk away. And it was difficult and and you did it, maybe and pulled it back and did it and pulled it back and you did this dance, but ultimately you left it there. But the reality is there are still things that you're standing in front of that you don't want to acknowledge that you have not entrusted to God. There are things that you're holding out on and saying, God, I trust you for these things. For some of us in here, it's zero. For others of us, it's seven. For others of us, it's 70. But there are still things you're standing in front of that you say, God, anything but these. And I just want to ask you the question today, why? Why is that? Why, why are there still things that you're holding on to, that you won't let go of, that you think you can lead your life better than he can. Who do you think you are? And I guess more importantly for me, who do I think I am? Because I struggle with the same thing. And today what we're after, what I wanna help you with is bring you to the end of our time together where we can identify at least a couple of the whys. Why am I still white knuckled? God, I'm not gonna let this one out of hand. I wanna help you identify what is keeping you from that and then you will be better equipped to simply answer the simple question that Jesus asked you today. Do you trust me or not? The first why, the first thing that is keeping you from trusting God is the fact that you think he is too small. Your God is too small. And as a result, you don't dare entrust everything to him. Some things maybe, but surely not everything. I forgot to mention, by the way, we're in John chapter 14 today. So if you have a Bible, please open there. If you don't, the verses I think are in our notes. But John chapter 14 is where we're going to look today. Let me read this first verse and it'll kind of set the tone of our time. John 14 Verse one, Jesus speaking to the disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. Those words are not in a vacuum. John chapter 14 is actually couched in a bigger kind of context. John chapters 13 through 17 are what theologians call the upper room discourse. And it is the time when Jesus is getting his last moments with these disciples. The the dinner begins in the upper room. It begins with 12. It's only going to finish with 11. Judas is going to walk out hell-bent on betraying the Son of God. Throughout this dinner, Jesus in John chapter 13, Jesus actually begins by getting on his knees and washing the grime from between their toes in an act of humility that demonstrates what I've done for you, do for each other. He calls Judas out and tells him, you're about to betray me, do what you do quickly. He tells Peter, Peter, before this day is over, three times you will say, you don't even know who I am. That's the, that's the context leading up to John chapter 14. So the, the, the feeling in the room, the atmosphere in this upper room with Jesus in these now 11 is tense. And it's in the middle of that tension that Jesus says these words. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. Three imperative verbs, command verbs. Do not let, as though you can control it. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust, trust, do it. Trust in God, now also trust in me. Simply said, 
Don't be afraid. Trust me. Trust me. Now I say those two words, and in the same way that the disciples had a context, John 14 was not happening in a vacuum, so in the same way you didn't show up today in a vacuum. Nobody came here at point zero in your life and in terms of your understanding of who God is and how reliable, how trustworthy he is in your life. Everybody has a context. And I know that for so many of us, those are the two most frightening words you could hear. Trust me. Because you've had numerous people tell you that throughout your life. People who are supposed to be trustworthy. People who told you You can believe me. You can count on me. I'll be there. Trust me. Be careful today as we talk not to confuse Jesus with those people. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But make no mistake, that's what Jesus is telling the disciples. It's also what he's telling you and me today. Don't be afraid. Trust me. Now see, the disciples hadn't really Bought all the way in yet, and, and their actions are going to demonstrate that. See, they believe that Jesus was Messiah, whatever that meant, right? He, this Messiah had been prophesied. All their forefathers had been telling them for ages, this, this unique individual from God, unlike anyone else, is coming. Look for him, and they found him. And Jesus continued to say, you've been looking, and he, I am he. Look no further. But, but, but there's something different about Jesus being an amazing miracle worker, something different about him being an amazing teacher and him being God. That connect the dot hadn't happened yet. And the reason I know that just minutes, minutes after he tells them, don't be afraid, trust me, when a group of centurions come into a garden where Jesus is praying, they will all scatter to the winds. Jesus went to the cross absolutely alone. Nobody, nobody stood up for him or with him. So these 11 are going to scatter to the winds, and these words, don't be afraid, trust me, they're going to forget. And the reason I know that they hadn't bought in that he was completely who he said he was is because later on they do You see, Jesus gets arrested, goes through a kangaroo court, ends up on a tree, Their vision, their hope, their dream is dying on a wooden tree just hours after this conversation. But it's three days later. Three days later, when some women who went to Jesus' tomb come running back out of breath and tell them, you're not going to believe this. We talked to him and he's alive. The resurrection completely changed everything for the disciples. And the reason I know that, this thing we celebrate in a few weeks at Easter, is because the book of Acts records 11 incredibly courageous, incredibly bold, incredibly trustworthy men and a group of men and women who went and changed the world because they knew they were relying upon God not just some amazing person. That's when their trust really took place. My simple question to us is, what's your excuse? What is your excuse? The disciples hadn't seen Jesus die on a cross and raise the third day, but you and I live on this side of the resurrection. We know the story. We know what happens. And yet we still don't believe that Jesus is this God that he says he is. We still won't say, God, I've got these things behind me that I don't know if you're big enough for. I don't know if you can handle. I don't know if I could even give them away. And part of the reason is, is that you simply don't believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be. And therefore your God is too small. I brought out my friend Mike and my daughter Aaliyah today. Aaliyah turned 11 a week ago. Today, actually. Did you know that? Just a week ago. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, Aaliyah's 11, and uh, Mike is huge. (laughs) Okay? And I brought them out today because I wanted you to see this with your eyes, what was kind of gearing in my mind all along. And it's simply this. 
that as long as your God is this size, you are going to put very little on his shoulders. You're going to trust him with very little. And, and there's a reality of which it's not like there's no God. The space isn't vacant. There is a God. He's just super small. And he does good things and he helps you out when he can, but he's not able to shoulder you. You go through difficulties and crisis and you go to fall back. Are you kidding me? I'm going to flatten her if I do that today. There's no way I'm going to entrust my well-being to this size of a God. But, it, but if your God is this size, if your God is more like the God who he says he is, then you go through difficult times, you go through crisis, you go through even just daily stuff that you go, God, I don't know how to do this. And all of a sudden, when you lean back, okay, look at that. Thank you so much, Mike. <laughs> But, but I, can I tell you this? There wasn't a single ounce of fear when I fell right now. And if you stood up here with me, you would do the same. Duh. Okay, he's, he's trustworthy. And, and it's not just because even Mike's big. Because you know what a lot of big guys could do? Step aside just a sec, babe. They could stand here and go, <laughs> that Todd guy really drives me nuts. Okay? And that would be an ugly mess right now on the floor. But I know Mike, and I know Mike not only for his size, but I know his heart. And I know that when I asked him, Mike, would you stand up on stage and be an, uh, a visual illustration of the fact that your God is big and you can trust him, that I knew Mike could, not only could catch me, but that he would. See, what do you know? What do you know of this Jesus? And the things that you know or don't know of him, they're keeping you. They're keeping you from being able to lean into him because in this illustration, as, as big as Mike is, as strong as he is, he doesn't even compare to the size that God really is and what he wants you to trust him for. This is the best I could do. But I'm telling you, as long as you keep God this size, you will not lean back on him because you're a fool if you were. If God was really only this strong, only this big, then you're the fool who leans back into that. God's that big, and the more you get to know him. You know what's interesting? The Bible that I have is the same one that you have. It's the same one that every pastor on the staff has. It's the same one that every small group leader has. There's nothing magical about my Bible. There's nothing magical about theirs. You pick it up. You begin to get to know who this God is and the promises that he makes to you and you begin to realize he says he's this big, but I've been thinking he's only that big. And it begins to fuel the opportunity for trust because now I know a little bit more of what I'm getting into. Would you thank Mike and Aaliyah today? Thanks, you guys. Get to know this Jesus. Get to know who he says he is that's the beginning of being able to trust him. Number two, you don't trust God because your stories are too few. Your stories are too few. Number one, your God is too small. You wouldn't dare lean back on that God, but also your stories are too few. And let me explain what I mean by that. Look at our, our text. The next few verses in John 14, verses two through four, this is Jesus just continuing to talk. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to my father's house to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Anytime you've ever been in a conversation with a spouse, with a parent, with a child, with a friend, and they begin the conversation don't be afraid. Trust me. What do you do? I need to sit down. Uh, I, I need to brace myself. I need a teddy bear. I mean, I, I need something. What you're about to tell me is going to be challenging. What you're about to tell me is going to be something that is, I'm going to have to do something with. 
And that's exactly what happened in John 14. Jesus begins the conversation, don't be afraid, trust me. And now he tells them why. Don't be afraid, trust me, and here's why, because I'm leaving. I'm getting ready to leave you. Now, by the way, this shouldn't have been a complete bombshell on the disciples because Jesus had been telling them literally for months, I'm leaving you. I'm going to Jerusalem to die. I'm going and returning to the Father. He had been telling them this for months. They just kept going. It's almost as though when Jesus was talking, he's sharing with them these amazing truths. And then when he starts talking about leaving, it's almost like Charlie Brown's teacher shows up. And then he keeps talking again. It's like they just were like totally disconnected. What are you talking about? What do you mean leaving? You're the Messiah. You came from God to set up the kingdom and there's 12 thrones and I'm ready to sit on one. You leaving was not a part of the equation, Jesus. And there is great fear. I love, by the way, that in Jesus' last hours, he knew exactly what was to come. But in his last hours, he was primarily concerned with his disciples' fears, not his own. And he had fears. We read about that in the Garden of Gethsemane. God, if there, Father, if there's any other way. But he deals with their fears because that's what it is to be others-focused. And so he addresses these fears and he tells them, because I'm going to leave. Now, you got to remember what the disciples had already trusted Jesus for. Remember, everything we've said today is not in a vacuum by any means. There's a context. And look what they had already said. Jesus, if you say it, I believe it. Jesus, I find you reliable for things like this, things like their careers. Jesus said, drop your nets and follow me, and their nets fell. Jesus said, trust me for your families. He said, If you don't love me more than father or mother, brother or sister, then you're not worthy of following me. And they left and they followed. They had trusted Jesus for their reputation. The Pharisees continued to belittle them. To be assigned or to be aligned with Jesus was to be one many times that was, are you kidding me? That guy's nuts. They had already trusted Jesus for their safety. How many times was Jesus casting demons out of demon-possessed, demoniac, crazy, not just crazy, but scary people? And they were standing nearby in harm's way. And Jesus said, hang on. They're out on a boat in the middle of this crazy storm. Fishermen who'd been there millions of times before, they're afraid for their own lives. Jesus stands at the top of the boat, tells simply the storm, chill out. And it does. They had trusted him for their safety. They trusted him for their provision. On more than one occasion, Jesus fed thousands of people out of a lunch. It's pretty clear he could handle 12 people on a pretty consistent basis. So they had trusted Jesus for so many things, but here's was the problem. They were being asked to trust Jesus for something new. And not just a new thing, but a huge thing. Don't be afraid. Trust me, I'm leaving. Jesus, that's so big. You're here today and you have something or some things that are big. They're the things that you keep hiding behind your back. And for me, what helps me is that the way I identify those, I have this in your notes, the way I identify those, how do I identify the thing or things that I don't want to entrust to God, that I'm still holding on to. It's simply, what would you fill in this blank? Lord, please don't take away from me or ask me to. Lord, please don't take my family away from me. Lord, please don't take my spouse away from me. Lord, please don't take my career away from me. Lord, please don't take my health away from me. Lord, please don't take fill in the blank, away from me. Lord, please don't ask me to to talk to that person who has wronged me, to talk to that person I need to confront, to let go of the things I'm finding security in. Don't ask me to move to the high desert. (laughs) Too late. 
too late. One that you've all let go of already. Praise God. You can feel good about yourselves. You've at least trusted God for one thing. That's good. What, what you fill in that blank or the things you fill in that blank are the things that you're holding behind you that you say, Jesus can have all this. I trust you for those, but I don't want to talk about these. And what I want you to do is I share with you one of mine. I want you to actually, those blanks are things obviously I can't fill in for you. But I want you to take a moment and just a quiet second. I want you to fill in the blank for you. This is how it happened to me. I was up speaking at a camp years ago and um, was really encouraged and challenged by a, a speaker who was there at the same time. He had been a missionary uh, with New Tribes Missions in Papua New Guinea for uh, 20 years, had gone in with his family. Just him and his wife, I believe, initially had three, four children during that time, had seen a tribe as they just lived among this group of people, translated the Bible, and, and actually helped them. They never had had a written language, so developed a written language, then put the Bible in that language and saw that tribe, mem- those members come to Christ, develop their own church, and he had left and now was telling other people, have you ever considered the way that God might want to use your life to a group of people who have no inkling as to who Jesus is. And we're sitting there talking. His name was Brad, and Brad and I are chatting, and I just talked to Brad one time. I said, Brad, how did you do? How did, how did you go into a jungle and, and take your kids? How, how did you do that? Because for me, the only time my kids see crocodiles is when we're on the jungle cruise at Disneyland. You know, the, the only time that my kids see anacondas is uh, in, behind glass at the pet store. The only time that my kids get sick and can't get to the doctor, can't get the antibiotics they need is just because I have to wait till the morning. Brad, Brad, how did you do that? How did you trust God for your kids, their health and their safety in that environment? And his, ample, his answer was so simple, Todd. God called us to the jungles of Papua New Guinea and anything he called us to, I knew he would provide us with. And I just had to, my children, along with everything else that would fit that list, I just simply had to bring to his feet and say, God, you know I love, I love these kids, but I know that you love them infinitely more. They're in your hands, and if you're calling us to go, by all means we go. What, it, what is in your blank? God, please don't take away. God, please don't ask me to. That's the thing, and here's the thing I want you to hear today. Some of us don't even want to write it down because to write it down is both to acknowledge it as well as to say, now I got to deal with this. But can I tell you something? The reason it was so easy to come to your mind just like this is because it's the button that God keeps pushing in your life. You see, you know that, right? You know that God, because he is a perfect heavenly father and he has your best interests in mind, that he will not allow you to sit there and cuddle up next to this thing you won't let go that is ruining your life. It's not even a bad thing. I'm not talking about some habitual sin. I'm talking about a good thing. I'm talking about people. But he will not let you cuddle up to those and hold on tight because he knows they make horrible gods. They can never be what he is supposed to be in your life. And he will continue to bring things into your life to pry open your hands so that you let them go and you trust him. Because trusting God is your best interest. He is the only one that you can fully lean into. You see, the disciples that night, what they should have done when Jesus said, don't be afraid, trust me, I'm leaving, what should have come to mind were all the examples of the times that they had experienced Jesus' amazing reliability, his amazing trustworthiness. Think of all the times he showed up in God-sized ways. Why is he going to stop now? And what they should have done is remember their altars. In the Old Testament, what people would do is they would pile up a stack of rocks called an altar at unique times when God showed up in God-sized ways. 
Abraham did it, Isaac did it, Jacob did it, Moses did it, Joshua did it. The kings of Israel and Judah did it. They pile up rocks and they give them names and they would say, God is my provision. God is my stronghold. God showed up and demonstrated himself so strong here today. And they did it as a reminder to themselves and to future generations that when you come into difficult times, you can remember, you can rely upon the God who showed up here because he's consistent and he doesn't change. He is trustworthy and the stack of rocks tells me so. Simple question for you today. Do you have any altars? Do you have any stacks of rocks in your life? Some may honestly answer today and say, you know, Todd, I really don't. I've never seen God show up in God-sized ways. And I want to say, if that's your answer today, I'm not critical of it. I, it could be a very honest answer. But what I, was, what I do want to say is this. If you don't have a stack of rocks where you have seen God demonstrate his trustworthiness to you in ways that just blew your mind, can I simply tell you? It's because you have more than likely simply added him to the equation of your life. You've got a pie and you've given him a sliver and said, Jesus, you can fit this amount. I'll show up to church every other weekend if it works for me. I will be a part of a small group someday because it's just too much time and accountability. I'm not ready for it. Jesus, I would read my Bible, but I don't know where to start. And on the list goes, Jesus fits a nice, convenient slice in your life. And as long as you keep Jesus that safe and that small, there's no reason he's going to show up in your life in some God-sized way because he can't be. Because you kept him contained. He's just another piece. He's just religion for you. And you might say, Todd, then how do I do that? How do I start trusting God for God-sized things? Because I got a list. <laughs> That's not the issue. I just don't even know how to begin to let them go. Well, it might sound a little bit like what it feels like at a job interview sometimes. You go to the interview and, and you're there and you say, I'd like to get a job. Person interviewing you looks over your resume, you need more experience. And you say back, well, how, how do I get more experience? Guy says, you need a job. You go like, Exactly. Well, so how do you do this? How do you trust God? In your notes, you surrender. You surrender. You, you trust God by surrendering those things you're holding behind your back that you are white-knuckled and not letting go of. You, you come from behind and you begin to pry your fingers back and you hold them open-handedly and you say, God, I give this to you. It is no small task. Not once have you heard me say that. But you embrace the words that Jesus said, don't be afraid, trust me. Now some would say, okay, Todd, that's really hard to do. I get it. So, so how do I surrender? How do I do that? Simply uh, trust God. They are cyclically connected. I, I can't trust God unless I surrender. I won't be able to surrender if I really am not trusting God. They are really one and the same. And those of you that are here today that you have stacks of rocks, you, you have piles of rocks in your life where you look back, and if you did, I, here's what I want you to do. But before you go to bed tonight, before you go to bed, I want you to take some time and I want you to identify some of those stacks of rocks, some of those altars in your life. And what's going to happen is you're here today, you're going to be able to look backwards and you're going to see this path, this crazy path of God's goodness and faithfulness reliability, God-sized things he shows up and you're gonna see this dotted path working backwards where you go, God, I can't believe these things you have done up until now. How foolish of me to think you won't keep doing them in the current thing I'm in that I can't seem to let go of. Let it be just a huge encouragement to you today, a reminder of the stacks of rocks you have experienced. Name them like the Israelites did, name them. And here's the win. It's not just a reminder for your sake. It's a reminder for your kids. I hope you let your kids into some of that business. Maybe not all. Maybe not all of it's age appropriate. Maybe not all of it's good timing. But I hope you let your kids into the business of the time that God brought a loan modification just in the nick of time. 
that you remind them about the time that your marriage was about ready to be done. You remind them of the time that God brought healing to your life or healing to someone that they're connected to and you saw this amazing turn of events. This time that you were ready to give up and throw it all away. And God brought this last second reminder to you and said, don't be afraid, trust me. Share those stories with your kids. Share those stories with your oikos. And they will be blown away by the way God has been faithful to you. Third reason, I need to work on my math. Third reason why you don't trust God is that you're finding your security somewhere else. You're finding your security in something else. There's a guy named Jack who was walking on the side of a ledge one day. He was walking on this and he'd been here before, but as he was, his foot slipped for a moment and he fell. And as he fell, he reached out and grabbed a root that was sticking out of the side of the the ledge there, and he grabbed on tight, and and he was a few feet below the the surface, the top of the ledge, looked down and realized there was a thousand feet between him and the bottom of the canyon. Jack is in a predicament. He is in a tough spot. And Jack begins to yell. He doesn't know what else to do. He's holding on this root, but he knows it's not going to last forever. And he starts yelling, Help! Help, is anyone there? Throw down a rope, do something, help. He's just yelling, help. And all of a sudden, he hears this, Jack, I'm here. Who, who, who is that? Where are you? And the voice says back, it's Jesus, Jack. Jesus, you're, you're here. That's so great. Jesus, I will do anything. I will start going to church every weekend. I'll join a small group. I'll do anything you ask. Please get me out of this situation. Jesus, save me. And Jesus says, hey, Jack, hold off on the promises. Let's just get you out of the situation. And he says, Jack, what you need to do is you need to listen to me. Do, do what I tell you to do. And Jack says, anything. I'll do anything you tell me to do, Jesus. Jesus says, good. Jack, now... Let go, of the ro- let go of the branch. Let go of the root. Huh? Yeah, let go of the root. Just trust me, Jack. Let go of the root. And there's a, there's a long pause. And the next words out of Jack's mouth are so telling. Help! Help! Is there anyone else up there? And isn't that the way it is? You've got a root, you've got a branch that you are holding on to, you're finding security in, but it is just a matter of time. Gravity will take its course. And when God shows up, that's what he always begins with. Let go. Let go of that. That's weak. It's inept. It's not going to work. And instead, hold on to me. And I can't do both. In your notes, this is the problem. This is the tension that we find ourselves. We want something that you can control apart from being dependent upon God. That, that's this tension. That's, the, that's what is the motivation inside of you. God, I want, if I'm honest with myself, I want something I can manage, something I can see, something in a sense that I'm in charge of, rather than having to be that kind of dependent upon you. Thomas felt the same way and the same Uh, passage we're in, John 14, the next two verses. Listen to what he says. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Remember Jesus' last words, you know where I'm going to. We don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, Thomas's words were, Jesus, um, how, how can we know the way to where you're going when you haven't told us the destination, the location. Duh. (laughs) You know, give me a good map, Jesus. Give me a good map and I can figure out where it is that you're going to and and I'll I'll get there. Jesus says, "Uh, Thomas, I am the map. I am the map. I always have been. It has always been through me that you are ever going to get home to the Father. And can I put that out to you for a minute today? Isn't that what we all want? Don't we all want to get home to the Father? 
Don't we all want to take these things that are so burdensome to us, things that we are so stressed out over, things we are so afraid of, and drop them off, at our, sh- off our shoulders, walk through the threshold, and walk into this embrace of a heavenly Father who says, welcome home. That's what we all want, and I have great news for you. That is the gospel. That is exactly what Jesus came to do. That is exactly what Jesus is trying to tell his disciples. Don't be afraid. Trust me. I'm leaving, and I'm going to make it good. I'm going to provide a way back to the Father. What you really, really want is what I came to do. There is a loving God who looked into a world that was completely broken, completely on rails for punishment, destruction, and an eternity apart from him. And it's to that world he sent his one and only son to take on flesh, become one of us, die for us, and then kick death's butt. I never have said that in church before. It was so cool. On Easter Sunday, expressing once and for all What can't I do? You don't understand who I am. That's the gospel. And yet these things that you're holding on to that you keep behind your back that you don't want God to touch, here's the reality. You are finding a degree of security by holding on to them yourself. And I'm going to tell you that one thing at a time, those are going to fail you. One thing at a time, they're going to fall away and you're going to realize, I can't put my trust in that, it's inept. I can't put my hope in that, it fails. I can't find the reliability I need from life in in him or her because they leave. Everything fails. That is life. That is life on this planet. It's like you, you've had a 1997 Honda Accord with 300,000 miles on it. You have never taken it into the shop. It's never been anything but amazing for you, yet you drive to the Super Target on Tuesday, and the thing just quits. It quits on the side of the road, and you get out, and you are completely furious. How dare you? Kicking the tires. What a piece of junk. You know, you're just flipping out, and people are like, what's wrong? My car broke down. Oh, okay, so that's really disturbing to you. Um, why? It was never supposed to break. What, what dealer did you talk to when you bought that car? They all fail. And God in his loving way will continue to bring every reminder to you that they fail. Nothing here is sound. But there is a sound God. And he simply says to you today, do you trust me or not? Let me pray. Father, we come to you. And you have brought to our attention today, God, these things that we are holding behind our back, the things that we say, please don't ask me to do. Please don't take away. God, we acknowledge those, we recognize them. And God, would you give us the grace? Would you give us the strength? Would you take away our fear and help us to bring them from behind our back, release our fingers, and lay them at your feet? That we would trust you. You may be here today and and that stack of things behind your back, really there's one huge thing And it's you. It's your life, your agenda, your plan, your future. It's there, and and that has been the thing you've been holding out on. You have no stacks of rocks in your life because you've not surrendered your life to God. And the great news is, like we said a minute ago, before you even leave this place today, you can do that. That's the gospel. A is admit that you're a sinner Admit the reality that you cannot make your life work. Admit the reality that you have lived a life in defiance, living your own agenda against a God who has a wonderful design and purpose for you. B, believe. Believe that this Jesus we've talked about, when he hung on a cross, his blood spilt, his body broken, it paid for you. And C is choose. 
It's not just things that you say with your mouth. It's not just something you believe in your head. It's a volitional choice. Jesus, I lay me down at your feet and you can have everything of me. Please forgive me from my sin and myself. You can pray that prayer before you even leave this place today and you will be completely and forever changed. Father, you are good and your love endures forever. Thank you for loving us so profoundly, extravagantly in Jesus Christ. Amen.